technical program that we're looking to build. One of the, the really exciting things that I think we do at these forums is we seek to bring in other perspectives on quality, and I'm really delighted to introduce our second keynote for today. Uh, John Timmerman, who is the Chief Scientist and Customer, uh, customer Experience and Innovation at Gallup, um, is going to come and share with us some thoughts today about building a quality, uh, customer-centric uh, DNA within our organizations. And we really appreciate you, you joining us. I know you had to <laughs> join us from another meeting so, or, or come, come in halfway through the day, but we really appreciate you uh, taking the time to share with us today. Good afternoon. So glad you don't know if it's going to be a good <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's great. We had our, where do you want me to put it, sir? Is that on my Anywhere, yeah. Oh, Anywhere? Okay. Anyone here done the Clifton Strengths Finder assessment? Uh, okay, so we had a conference with about, I'm sorry? Yeah, that's fine. There you go. We had about a thousand attendees over the past two days, which is just remarkable. It looks like a robot here with all the wires sticking out, but at least you can hear me. The um, slides, can we put them up, sir? All right, great, thanks. Um, I, I, you know, I get really nervous on speeches, and I, you know, heart's beating fast, and I feel like I'm going to pass out. So they told me a great way to calm myself down is to build rapport with the audience. So this is a picture of my family. Now, now we actually have a, two other children, but this is the one we love, our daughter. So that's. <laughs> uh, but for, for those of you that um, hear of Gal, typically you connect to an awareness of polling, and that's correct because the organization's genesis was Dr. George Gallup developing a scientific method to be able to measure the voice of the people. Uh, at that point in time, he felt that if there was five billion people in the world, you know, growing to that number, now we've surpassed that, uh, we need to know the voice of every one of those five billion. So he developed those modern sampling methods. But then he was met with another gentleman by the name of Dr. Don Clifton. And this relates to the summit I just flew back from. Uh, while other psychologists were studying what made people behaviorally sick, he was studying what made people successful. And his initial sample was, over the course of his lifetime and career, two million people that he studied from all industries, trades, parts of the world, demographics to develop uh, a science to be able to really understand what makes each individual person great around their special talents. I'll spend a little bit of time with that as we talk together. Uh, I, I worked for Gallup prior to Gallup. I oversaw global operations for Marriott prior to that, global operations and quality for the Ritz-Carlton Hotel Company uh, worldwide. And during my stint after Ritz-Carlton, I did work for the Cleveland Clinic for about five years overseeing quality, and at that point in time, we were just doing some basic things when it came to patient experience and innovation, like showing the patient their chart was like a breakthrough <laughs> at that point in time, back in 1995. So I, I have got extreme appreciation for the work that you're doing, the impact that you make on society. Uh, from our economists who've studied uh, the United States, um, we, we see that there's three things required to maintain economic superiority. And when Gallup studies data, uh, we want the truth. And so uh, getting the truth is always asking the right question in the right way. So, for example, when we call a home in the United States, um, it's very different than uh, the response and the percentages when we ask somebody if they own a firearm than when the uh, ATF calls. It says, hi, I'm from the government. Do you have a firearm? So our numbers are always higher. And although the, you know, the public reporting on unemployment looks like it's improving uh, in a generally positive direction, uh, we don't measure unemployed. There's, there's a lot of noise in those numbers. We measure the people um, in the United States that have a good job. And a good job is I've got a standard of 32 plus hours per week. And there's only 40% of Americans that can say yes to that statistic. 
We want to know how much economics impacts someone's overall well-being. And we measure well-being in terms of your health, your connectedness to the community, your job, your financial stability, uh, your relationships with friends and family. And about $75,000 household income is the cutoff point where there's nominal gain once you go beyond that for things like well-being. We want to measure when there's going to be a change in regimes. Uh, so what's, what's the hope of a nation? So we have a, a hope index where we ask two questions, two simple questions but very powerful. First question is imagine life as a ladder. We first started testing this. We use the term basement. It doesn't really work well in areas like the Middle East and some parts of the world. So you've got to get a concept that everyone can connect to. But imagine life as a ladder, and the first rung would be the lowest, uh, and the 10 would be the highest in terms of your uh, well-being. Uh, what rung are you on today? And that's really not the important question. The important question is, what rung do you see yourself on in five years? The difference between those two points, low and high, is the hope gap. So it's just not where you are, but it's where you see yourself. And we've calculated that if a country has a big differential between where someone is and the hope being much lower to where they see themselves in five years, uh, that regime's leadership has about four years to get out of town. So that's usually where you start to find that there's a, a downfall and a changeover of government. So asking the right questions is just incredibly important. And the work that I've done with Gallup uh, over the past uh, five years is less on the quantitative side, more on the qualitative. So it's interviewing neurosurgeons and, and uh, neurologists and understanding, you know, what drives overall value and impact. Um, and, and my general finding correlates what you've been discussing here in the forum. You got to have product quality, and the, the the docs will tell you a little, you know, one millimeter here, there in terms of dimensions of the product or whatever that might be, and. You have to have empirical research, although they still, even though they want it, they look at everything that's published sideways, right, the, the bias factor in it. But what really resonates is uh, the ecosystem, so it's a patient pathway. How can that collectively be improved for the impact of, of both the patient, the beneficiary, as well as everyone that's in that ecosystem? Well, you know, so I work with a lot of industries, uh, background 25 years running hotels, hospitality, I've worked in healthcare, I've worked for financial clients, I've worked for automotive clients, the entire spectrum. And yeah, everyone's a little bit different, but the key success factors tend to be more the same, irregardless of the industry. And when I got to Gallup, I thought that there would be big differences in data between hospitality and hospitals, for example. But the highest variation in our data sets, you know, half a billion employee data sets, 25 million, you know, uh, supervisor, manager data sets, just big data, there's more variation within a company than variation between companies. When you look at the aggregate of the data and how those variances kind of start to play out at benchmark level. So when I was at Ritz Carlton, I, I would get letters from guests, common cards and feedback and the the, the ones that were complaints, and although we tried to strive to, you know, create a memorable experience for everyone that we served, we still had opportunities, breakfast of champions, and I take those complaint letters and I give that to Kate, my VP of ops, and she'd go deal with those. And the good letters I would sit in my office and read because they'd make me feel good. And, and this letter was from a couple with their daughter, not the daughter, just the, it's an image representative. They were traveling from Tokyo to Central Park, Ritz Carlton. And when they arrived at the hotel and they got up to the room, the little girl realized that she couldn't find her teddy bear. And so they called the bell services. It's not down in the luggage car. They brought in loss prevention security. They couldn't find it in the hallways. They pulled in housekeeping. They're going under the bed, looking everywhere for the teddy bear. And I go on to read, and it was the housekeeper that got a good description of the teddy bear. Went out after work to build a bear replicated the bear, put it in the, in the guest room the next day with a note saying, I'm sorry, I got lost, I, you know, so excited in the big city, I love you, so happy to be back with you. Now, I'm a former Marine, and I'm bringing in the tears just like coming down. <laughs> My cheeks just like, please, no one look at me right now. What's remarkable is we didn't pay those housekeepers any differential premium than the housekeepers that worked at, let's say, the Hyatt or the Hilton or the Holiday Inn. They got paid the same page rate and pay them any differently. And there's no standard operating procedure that says, 
you know, if teddy bear this or if giraffe that or and so on and so forth. What's also amazing, I ran a housekeeping apartment. Those ladies and gentlemen clean about 16 rooms a day. They're turning a room about every half an hour. And that room has to look like no one else has ever been in it. That's some of the hardest work you could possibly do. And to spend 20 plus bucks on a bear, knowing what the housekeeper gets paid, that's a new pair of shoes for, for one of her kids. I mean, talk about economic, you know, for me, 20 bucks, whatever, for most of us. So how do you get that? How do you create that in a culture? Well, organizations try a lot of things. They have campaigns, they develop reward systems, they try to acquire some talent. Let's hire the person from Ritz-Carlton. And when I came to Cleveland Clinic, they, they asked me, my, my directive and orders were, please make Cleveland Clinic like the Ritz-Carlton. And I shocked the senior leadership. I said, I don't know if that's right or not. Give me 90 days to study the culture and I'll come back and tell you what can be used and what's actually probably gonna backfire. And so there were some key principles that were implemented developing patient-centered values. But if, if, if you work in healthcare for even a day, you know that the psyche of the culture is you're not giving somebody a loaf of bread. I mean, we're, we're taking care of patients. It's a very a different language, linguistics that, that you use when you're developing a service in patient-centric environment. And then also, you know, participation. Let's talk. Participation programs are not bad. They're good. They get people involved. But you tend not to see sustainable outcomes with these conventional approaches. And there might even be an acronym in here when you take a look at it. I don't know. <laughs> they always filter what I say, so I got to put it on slides. So what are the benchmarks? So I, I got to Gallup, and I was asked five years ago to, to develop the Gallup model for creating a customer, patient-centric, client-centric culture. Because I do basically, what I do is cultural engineering. I guess is what you would say for the work that I do. And I went through all our data, 70 years of data and case studies with our clients and impact analysis. And I came back to the leadership team, to our CEO, Jim Clifton, I said, good news, bad news. Uh, the good news is we've got a model. The bad news, it's not a Gallup model. <laughs> We're not gonna put our, our trademark on this one. It's really the performance excellence framework because when, as a Baldridge examiner, recipient, and now chair of the judges, when I went through all our data, it bless you, it fell into this holistic system to be able to evaluate and manage an organization. Evaluate is measure, and if you can't, can't manage, you can't measure it to get the metrics, and then how do you manage it in terms of planning, control, innovation, and improvement. So I'm gonna take you through our findings across this model. So strategy. Uh, one of the things organizations have to be very clear on, does everyone know and understand your brand promise? And this gets confusing in many respects. Some people think of it as an advertising slogan. We did work with Southwest Airlines when they launched, so you're free to boom about your country. Uh, this is a jingle. You have to change it every three, six months, or whatever that right interval is, but that's not your brand purpose. It's, it's not your mission. So for Southwest, it was to get everyone, all the employees together, democratize the skies, allow our airline will be the first one to allow people with lower economic status the ability to go home and see their family on a holiday with trick flights and five-minute turns and so on. But their brand promise is really low-cost, efficient, direct flights. That, that was their brand promise for the organization, and it's very clear. And, and this, is, this is a test that I do with executives when we're working on design culture. We first start out with brand promise because that's the blueprint for everything else that we do. And a lot of these read like textbooks. Do they pay, you know, Gallup does consulting. I'm more on the research scientific side, but you pay some good consultants and everything I read, I have a very low opinion of. It looks like a textbook. It looks like whatever any other organization could have said about what they promised to deliver. The other exercise I like to do with executives is get them all in a table and ask them to write down on a piece of paper their brand promise. I've worked with some great organizations. I've yet to encounter one where every executive was aligned, even remotely, on the brand promise. So how, how, can, how can you expect to align the organization? In fact, I was, uh, there's one of our clients, it's a big client, I was told I could never come back to visit started a fight when I did the exercise. <laughs> because they spent a couple million redefining, positioning their brand, and the CMO, chief marketing officer, was 
using the old brand promise and the CEO was upset and the SCP of HR is trying to help him out and she's telling him, oh, this, this, and it just totally unraveled. But when we, we measure how many people really understand the brand promise, this was shocking for me when we captured and, and analyzed the data. One in three employees strongly agree they understand their organization's brand promise. I'll give you another statistic in the United States. Only one in two employees, not other companies' employees, your employees, feel like they know what's expected of them at work. Now, do they all have job descriptions because you're all very sophisticated? Yes, they do. Do you all have an orientation program? Probably so. But when we ask them, it's only one in two say, yeah, I really think I know what's expected of me. If we can't get at those fundamentals, then let's not even talk about some of these other things that you want to do in terms of interventions uh, in the organization. But here's the shocker. Six out of ten executives, these are C-suite SVP levels when we cut the data. I would expect that that would have been like 100%, right? But six out of ten. Six out of ten. So defining the brand promise and also measuring the things the right way. Uh, I'm not going to throw other uh, metric companies under the bus, uh, but what I will say, though, is you want a metric that's discriminating for the outcomes that you're trying to evaluate. And what I would say is most of the metrics that I've evaluated, our scientists have evaluated, they're not bad. They give you some data. So if you use NPS, continue to use NPS, or whatever metric I just used as an example, but make sure that you've got really good business impact on those things. Uh, there's a lot of hype uh, that's not always substantiated. So when we measure it, uh, we use Likert scales because we've got people that got PhDs on just scale methodology. Um, so is it a five, is it a 10? It's whatever scale is going to discriminate the outcome. If we could get it to a three-point scale, philosophically, that would be ideal. For most of the metrics, five tends to give the level of discrimination. When you get into 10-point scales, it becomes more difficult for people to evaluate those metrics. What's the difference between a six and a seven and an eight? And I could spend an entire day with you on that. So, uh, but that's our point of view as a scientific research organization. But we have that, that feedback you want to put into some buckets. And so we evaluate the relationship between a consumer and a brand and we've got different metrics for B to C. B to C, there's more complexity on it because what we find for your companies, whether it's, you know, Medtronic, Stryker, Siemens, Cisco, there tends to be 36 nodes on the decision network for making a decision. Physicians are one of those. This uh, procurement thing over here that tries to neutralize everything is, is one of those too. But there's about, on average, 36 decision makers that are involved in that overall process with different weight factors of influence. But on the simplest form for consumers, we put them into three buckets. Are they engaged? Are they indifferent? Indifferent could be good. And then are they actively disengaged? And you see when you measure them across things like, do I have pride in the, in the brand that I'm affiliated with? Uh, do they um, make good on their promises? Not are they perfect, but when something goes wrong, do they make good on, on their promises? When we take a look at those more emotional metrics, there's a differentiation in the share wallet, both on, on B2C and B2B and the different types of relationships. Different metrics for B2B. One of the most powerful metrics that we've tested is a very simple one, easy to do business with. I mean, that is just a powerful metric that can predict a lot of outcomes for, for that type of a relationship. But you still see that there's a 23% differential against the index for being highly emotionally attached, but even if you're actively disengaged, it's 97. And that's because consumers don't have his choices. I worked with one of the largest retailers. They have 17,000 stores. And when we did that study, there's an impact for the emotional attachment, but uh, you find that if, the, if you have a choice between, let's say, brand X and brand B, and one's on my street corner, I'm not gonna walk across the street unless they're significantly different, right? So, there's, so this kind of plays out, but it gives you an advantage. In, in that relationship and the impact. So the other thing to talk about is, is leaders. Uh, we did a study of our database of, of leaders and what made leaders really exceptional leaders, not just a leader that we would say we recommend you select them versus we recommend that you don't select them. And when we recommend not selecting, we're pretty close most of the time 
because of kind of the, the response is that we're looking at conceptual matches, but not just ones that we would recommend, ones that are really exceptional. And so we started with a qualitative study. We broke it down into the quant study, 40,000 liters, and then we related it back to impacting the culture. And so these are the seven domains that were very different between not just a good leader, but an exceptional leader. And the ones that relate to culture and change, they did two things. They would explain reality and they would create a compelling vision. And they did both of those two things. The good leaders did one of the two, but not both together. So uh, I'm, I'm scientific and when I got to Gallup, we're all assigned a coach. Everyone has a coach in our organization. And we feel the biggest impact you can have is through the personal relationship between someone that has a coach that's helping with their development, and that has to be done through a personal relationship. And my coach told me, he said, um, you're very good at creating the burning platform. So for those of you who have gone through Strength Finder, uh, command is number one. I get extreme enjoyment telling a CEO that their company is going to fail. I, mean, I get a net, it's, it's, you know, the, the, I just, it's just the greatest feeling, right? Uh, but I was coached to say, yeah, you have to say that, but you have to say, and your success will be determined by this. And the vision forward, too. Not that you're going to go off the rails. And great leaders really do that well. Uh, they maximize values of people. They have a, a very keen sense of who they are and who they're not. Who they are and who they're not. And these are not just one-shot leaders, like I did really great in pharma or real estate or whatever. We studied leaders that had different industries and multiple experiences and they maximize the values of their team. We'll talk about a little bit how they do that. The other thing that these great organizations uh, knew that they, every first conversation had to be about the brand promise, about the values. And we, we, we did interviews with one of these CEOs. We said, you say this every time and it's the same story you give over and over again. And he said, I'm tired of saying it because it's the 500th time, but it's probably going to be the first time that it really sinks in and it sets the example. They do daily calibrations on the values, so it's not a one-time orientation. It's woven into the onboarding, into the daily communiques, into the recognition programs. There's typically about 15 contact points the values are woven into in the employee life cycle. So anybody who do scuba diving? So you do scuba diving, there's a rule. So a former dive instructor, we have to teach you a technique 15 times five different ways to make sure that you survive in the open water. And, 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 and that's a very technical thing. And, and that's the same principle when you look at value systems, how they're inculcated into the overall organization and all the communication processes. And they create this thing called brand ambassadors. We'll talk about those. These are individuals that are on fire for the organization. Uh, they know the brand promise. They're extremely proud of the products and services. And we've interviewed ones that uh, worked in aerospace. And even though their family would not buy a jet engine, they would say, well, if they had to get a jet engine, this is just the one they got to have. And they knew all the specs, and it didn't matter what the role was. And these are people that are a catalyst in your organization. It's, it's building your... It's building your special forces team, your, your team of ninjas. And these people don't always have manager titles. In, in many cases, the most impactful ambassadors I find in research are people that are supervisory or informal le levels, where the other employees really uh, line up to. And we measure impact of like emotional engagement. If you have a low number of these versus a high ratio, we see that in our data. And we see that you have lower problem incidents. These are very proactive in catching these things. So um, here's, some, here's three macro themes that we find and we study these ambassadors across multiple industries. First, we take a look at motivation, intent. They have incredibly high work ethic. These people are like the energizer bunny uh, if you're looking for them. And this is something I didn't expect in the research. They are high perfectionists. They've got this maximization drive. It can never be good. It can always be better. Uh, relationships, well, one of the themes under here, they leave a lasting impression. We did interviews with clients across multiple industries. They would literally say, when I'm with so-and-so, they make me feel better. It's like a pheromone that they have. So it's just natural gift. And the work style, you know, they fulfill commitments, they have a high degree of responsibility. 
you can test and find those in your organization, and once you find out who they are, those are the people you want to leverage. So I'll, I'll give you a good example. So at Ritz-Carlton, we're starting getting into psychometric testing. Uh, I had a standardized process to resolve a complaint in a hotel. Actual flow chart, everyone was trained to it. We had metrics for how many complaints the night before, how many resolved. We had random sampling of people to verify that if we thought they were satisfied that they actually were. Just a great QA process in it. And the results were always like this. We had, a, we had, a, we had about 46% satisfaction, high top box with problem resolution. Now, in, in, in your industry, when something goes wrong, there, there could be a traumatic event, right? But I would say, and, and so I'm not, I'm not going to in any way undermine that, but I will say when somebody's paying $1,000 a night, them not getting in their cheese amenity, you would think it was a traumatic event, right? <laughs> like sometimes as an executive, you're thinking like, your world's not going to end right now. There's, there's worse things that could be happening, but that's the reality. And, and so we were always flat, and so we took a little different way. We started looking at the strengths of our employees, and we looked for employees that had a high degree of persuasion and problem solving, right? Because we did a test where we gave all the problems at one time to the security loss prevention. Because they're highly analytical, they'll document it. We figure we'll win. We actually, the problem resolution satisfaction got worse. You know why? They were actually solving it, but the customer didn't feel like it was being solved. We, we started to look at the talents of the front desk, and we profiled individuals that had these, I can solve it, but I can make you feel like it's fixed. You ever been to airline, you, you want an upgrade, you go up to the desk, you say, hey, I'm so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, can you check me on the wait list? And they do something, you walk away, you don't feel good, you go to somebody else and say, hey, can you check on my upgrade? Because they didn't make you feel like they, they actually did something that, that you were looking for. And we went from that, that, that high number to 18, or excuse me, we, we went from 44% up to 78%, which is a dramatic number, by giving it to, hey, you're really good at solving problems and making somebody feel good about it. So we're not going to train everyone. It's just you, you, and you. And you're our ninjas for this. And we've got these other people that are going to be ninjas for these other things that they're going to do. So what attributes? So when you look at talent, here's a question. Is it, is it nature or nurture? So at, at the... Um, what is it? You know, the best scientists would say it's kind of 50-50. It's kind of the, the average, you know, that they kind of give to you. And so this is something that I was, I was watching on, on headline news a long time ago. This is the Moscow Circus of Cats. Anyone seen this? These cats are walking tight ropes, riding bikes, and doing backflips. And I've had, anyone had a cat? I've had two cats. I, you know, everyone's preference. I love cats. You know, I can, I can talk to you for a little while, and then I can do my thing, you do your thing, and we're cool with it, and, you know, they're, they got independent. And I, having two cats, I was just like, I'm watch glued to this. Like, that just doesn't seem like anything a cat would do, right? Because they're just, they're so independent. That's what I love about them. And uh, so the interview on Headline News asked a question. I said, oh, how do you train the cats? Well, then, then the response was, you can't train them. So the interviewer said, I'll get a little bit smarter. How do you motivate them? You know, use catnip, and he's trying to reach in. No, you can't motivate them to do this. And so then he finally asked. He got frustrated. And keeping composure, but you can tell frustrated, said, how do you do it? How do you get cats to, like, you know, do these backflips or tightropes and stuff? He says, I go out, and I find a cat that likes to do a backflip. <laughs> that was his response. Now, here's the problem. The HR department will, will give you all the woes of, oh, it's so difficult to find talent, and, oh, we got to get so many marbles on the funnel, and I just, you know, my eyes roll when I hear that. They're out there. They just don't work for you. <laughs> but they're actually out there. So when we, we, look at great, when we look at great managers, this is not executives. My earlier slides were executive level, like your level. This is managers. This, and this is the background of this research. We've been measuring engagement for several decades. How many people are engaged with their work? And only uh, one out of three in the U.S. are emotionally engaged. The, the rest of them are either just apathetic or they're just doing bad things. And it's been flat, though, for decades. And you would think that with, with all the training developments and, and education breakthroughs we've had, it should be improving. So we did a research on why is it not improving. Well, we find that the most impactful individual on someone's engagement is who they call their manager, their boss. 
it runs between 70 to 80 percent. It'll explain the variation. You got some variation on pay, or you know, uh, you know, you bought a ping pong table for us, and I don't play ping pong and all that sort of food and cafeteria. But it's really who you name the manager. Then our next third phase of the research was to find out how many people had a natural talent. The cat that can do backflips to be a manager. They don't need any training, no development. It's one out of 10 human beings. One out of 10. How many of you uh, worked for individuals that weren't those one out of 10s? <laughs> Not your current boss, right? And usually when we talk to a senior executive group like yourselves, and, and I, I would ask a question, I won't do it now, but uh, how many people have had like a transformational leader? It's usually like one to three, and it's a function of you work for like a great company. It's, but it's, it's really rare. Two out of 10 people can be developed. You send them to like a Gallup training program and the ROI is going to be like totally awesome. And they're typically your hypos, your high potentials, you know who they are. And you know, you'll spend 2,000, not just to train them, but for retention and many other reasons. But seven out of 10 don't, are not highly functional. And so what we're looking for at Gallup is new breakthroughs on how we aid those people. Because if you look at Gallup, we've really focused on the, the one out of 10 or the two out of 10. Now we're focusing on how can we help the seven out of 10 because they still have outcomes they have to achieve. And they need a very different approach than, than what we have today. Now, our point of view is current management systems have failed by function of the results haven't changed. And so we're really studying the seven out of 10 to see how we can better enable them. Because you just can't, you know, you can't just change the ship overnight. You've got to work with the, the you know, the sailors that you have on, on the deck today. So we look at ways to systematically identify talent, asking the right questions. Uh, a typical question for someone in a management position is you're looking for domains of relationship and influence and strategy and execution uh, would be a question around finding out how much drive they have to achieve things. And so that's a subdomain of competition. So I could ask you a question, are you competitive in a job interview? Raise your hand if you would say you were. I would, I mean, let's be truthful on this. Would you say you're competitive? So, so most of you would. And if you didn't raise it, if you've been through enough interviews, you kind of pick up that they're looking for that. Or like, especially, let me change it for a sales position. If you don't say competitive on that one, I mean, you're just like out of here, right? So in Gallup, the reason I don't work in business development is because when they were putting me through, they put me through six psychometrics um, they give me a question. They said, do you like making money for yourself for the organization? And I was like, oh, for the organization. And they kept on asking, oh, the organization. The salespeople, they actually like making money for themselves, right? It's not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. But they have to do it through the right ways and ethics, and it's, it's how they do it um, is, is the other part of the question, the intention behind they do that. But if, so, but if, if you ask the question very, so it doesn't, asking someone they're competitive doesn't really discriminate if they're really competitive. Uh, but if you ask it very differently, if I ask a question, how do you feel when you lose? Can you be a good loser? The most competitive people say, nope, I get angry, I get upset, I throw things, I just, and, and we've got a, we, one of our sons, uh, Parker, he's getting ready to go to uh, University of Longwood this year. Uh, when he was younger, um, I put him through these, you know, the strengths assessments. Now that's not a selection tool, but uh, to understand him, because if, if you want to develop somebody, you got to understand who they are beyond, you know, what you kind of get on the surface. And Parker, the, the, the teachers and, and people at church would give us unsolicited feedback, we love your son. We, we never got that except for our daughter and the other two boys. And it's just like, but I would walk by, I'd walk by the room on like a Saturday when we gave him video time, and he would be using vulgar language playing video games. They're like, oh my goodness. You know, I use the first approach of, you know, talking to him, Tell me understand and, you know, all this sort of, and then finally it's like, no, time out, video games going away and all this. I looked at his profile. His top theme is competition. Knowing that, it changed the dynamic. Now I talked to Parker, but Parker, you're feeling really upset when you lose at that video game. Oh, yeah, Dad, I get angry, and now let's talk about coping mechanisms. Because you're not a bad person. It's just like, if you know, competition's one of my top five. If you find me on the road, I'm not trying to harm you. If I, if I drive a little bit faster than you, my wife will say, John, turn down the competition. You could you know, endanger someone. Okay. It changes the dynamic of it. Um, you know, function creates structure in an organization. And if, if you had to ask me what's one of the most powerful things to creating 
the culture you want to design is first you design the brand promise and then you create methods, mechanisms, and vehicles for storytelling. I've studied some of the best cultures, whether it's manufacturing, service economy, technology, you essentially want to create storytelling. Now the problem with this is when I work, work with senior executives, I can get that up and going in a couple weeks. Uh, because they, by function of their job, they have to communicate and interact and you know, they can't be a wallflower. But the power is in how you develop managers to tell stories. Now when I was changing the, um, the value system for Ritz Carlton, they asked me to come back to the company because the company was actually starting to decline against competitors like Four Seasons. And when, when I first joined Ritz, our customer back in 1991 was very monolithic. It was a business traveler, Caucasian male. I could tell you the five magazines they read, the three types of vehicles they would drive. It was U.S. You know, we, we had international locations, but we were really a U.S. firm with some business abroad. And their age was, you know, average age median was about 55. Their income was typically around 500,000, 250 to 500,000. And they had about, you know, one and a half to five million net assets. I was a customer. And when I came back, everything that the company was doing around driving these very road prescriptive service philosophy was failing. And the more they reinforced that, the worse it actually got. Well, let's fast forward. Now we have a, a, a four cohort customer group. So we've got the veterans, which we want, don't go away, but we've got baby boomers, we got X and we've got millenniums on the horizon. Now we're in international markets. And one of the things that we do at Ritz-Carlton, when, when I first joined, we had 20 basics. You had to memorize them. In your first day, you had to recite them. Like I was literally in the bathroom before my orientation session, sitting there in the stall. I, was, I wasn't going to the bathroom. I was sitting there like trying to memorize this thing because I knew I had to get up in front of everybody and say it. Because if, if you can't, you know, for them, if you can't understand it and communicate it, how can you activate it? It's not about memorization, but you got to internalize it. And one of those was if, you, if, you, if someone needed directions, like you said, hey, you know, I need, to, um, I need you know, directions to the bathroom. So I said, oh, let me, let, me, let me escort you there, right? And that worked great for the veterans. They all love that. And I would say, oh, that was certainly my pleasure. And I'd do a half bow. And, oh, you just get excited. It's just so wonderful here. And I wish everyone could be like that. But um, I, I go to you. Now, different customer cohort, I come back sometime later. And you say, hey, hey, dude, where's the bathroom? I said, oh, let me take you there by the hand. You're like, dude, get away from me. So that's weird, right? So it was, it was, it was backfiring. So we did, we did 40 focus groups with our ambassadors, employees around the world that were the best of the best. And we gave them the problem. How do you maintain engagement with the veterans that love this, certainly my pleasure, and the other ones, the newer customers that say it feels non-authentic and it's like I got my pleasure with a machine gun during my experience. And one of our focus groups was in Beijing. And we should have gave this guy like millions of dollars in retrospect. So we posed this problem with our very best employees, and he said it. You don't treat the customer like you want to be treated or, or this or that. You treat the customer like they see themselves, right? And that was a pivot point, teaching our line employees how to actually read the customer and how they saw themselves at that particular moment. One of my best experiences as an executive was one of my worst experiences when I'd show up at a hotel and they'd have all the employees lined up in front to meet me and the general manager would come to me and I'd be on vacation and I was the first person they jumped on. My best vacation was at the Ritz Cancun because they ignored me and they went to my kids first. Oh my God, because they saw me. Now, when I'm there in business and everyone come on and you know, you know, get in front of me, right? But how they see themselves. And that was, that, was the, that was the insight that we needed, that Gal provided to us to really change that, that culture at that time. So we, we see in the world three types of employees, engaged, not engaged, or actively um, disengaged. And if you take a look at the world, it's only 14%. Some of these countries are like 8%. Um, I was working in one country in Asia uh, with, with one client where um, we, had a, we had to spend a couple hours educating them that first percentile is not good. They're, at, they're actually at the first percentile for employee engagement. Uh, and, you know, I, so, but it's really quite low. In the U.S., it's around 30%. 
but there's different outcomes for these people that are emotionally engaged. The reason we measure it, and, and Gallup, we're not about like creating work environments where people hold hands or somebody said kumbaya, singing a song. We're all about impact. We measure what we measure for impact. And we've got questions that we measure that, that people don't like, the question like, do you have a best friend at work? The only reason we measure that question is because it predicts three things, lower absenteeism, lower safety incidents, and lower theft, or what we call shrinkage. Because when that rate's very high, those outcomes improve. But you got to measure those things because they have an economic impact. And our, our great clients do that, a great organization. So transformational barriers. Um, Gallup strives, like Pew or any consulting company, McKinsey or e &Y, you go on the list, to be the very best at what they do. But if, if, we want to, if we want a reality check, we've got some clients we worked with where the outcomes were exceptional, and we have some that it was less than desirable. And so we did a, a, a post-mortem on, on those clients where we didn't achieve the outcomes we felt they should have. And we, we found some key barriers, and this, this relates to creating a culture. The first one is there has to be a belief in it. So and we, we do this as a readiness assessment for culture change. We want to understand, do the employees feel that the senior leadership is committed to this culture change? If not, then we can't go on to the next step in the implementation process. You're not ready for it. The second one is, do the employees feel that the messaging that they're getting around this is credible? I'll, I'll give you one example. Uh, part of our, our learning was a banking client, huge, one of the biggest banks in the world. And they were having problems with their culture change, and they, they hit belief. Everyone felt senior leaders committed to it, and they were there communicating and doing all the behavioral things that they needed to do. But when we talked to one of the um, tellers, she said, no, I don't believe in this, so because you're evaluating me on the scorecard, and one of the things on the scorecard is the ATM, and I don't, have, I don't have damn control over that thing, right? So just by function of that metric being on, on the evaluation system, totally undercut the entire change initiative. Accountability. This is, and, and this one, how many of you work in big complex matrix organizations? This gets really tough for you, the accountability thing, right? We can put on a piece of paper accountability. My favorite way of testing this is I, I meet with, I don't, I don't meet with the boss and ask, how do you keep your people accountable? I get a lot of, you know, textbook answers on that. I ask the employees, the subordinates, to show, to give me a recent example how your boss kept you accountable. Right, positive or negative consequences. Both have to be employed. So this accountability thing gets really tough for um, our accountability for um, matrix organizations. The third one I should have said is actionability. Do I have the tools, resources, knowledge to do what I need to do? But systemic issues could be technology. It could be information systems, infrastructure that get in the way. But the most common one is human capital. This is typically what we deal with 10 out of 10 times in big change initiatives building brand ambassadors, making sure that we've got the right stories for leaders to tell, working with senior leaders to create that belief in the organization. The accountability thing is probably one of the more challenging ones you deal with. Because it's not just changing somebody said the org chart, it changes the communication and decision processes in the organization. So if, if someone asked me what, what I saw my role as, it's, it's kind of this guy, it's Morpheus in the matrix. It's giving people data to make the right decisions, helping them take the red pill. So we take a look about change, we take a look at three prescriptions. One is understanding how people process information. How many of you are familiar with behavioral economics? Are you read any books on it for those who raise your hands? Which books are you reading? Oh, that's a big book to read. That's not a fast book to read, okay. Any different ones? That's Danny Kahneman's book. You know, he's one of our, our scientists, Nobel Prize winner. Our point of view at Gallup is we've gone through two evolution, evolutions of development. One, it's neoclassic economics, Taylor system, manufacturing design, and efficiencies. The second evolution was total quality management, lean, six sigma. There's a lot of words we could throw out that really have been incredibly helpful. And we use all those things at Gallup, too. We've, we've leaned our processes and helped improve those, so don't throw those away. Uh, our point of view is that um, behavioral economics is going to be the next revolution for organizations. So I'm going to give you a crash, crash course on behavioral economics, but it's essentially explaining human behavior in mathematical terms. So you have to play along with this one. I'm going to give you a series of images. When you see the image, 
I need you to participate. I need you to shout out what the image is, right? So your interpretation of the image. I've done this with groups as small as four. I've done it in Sao Paulo with this group as big as 3,000. I've done this, this experiment over 400 times. And right now, when I ask you to respond to the slide, right now I'm just counting your response time. All right, so see how you benchmark against others. First image, move. Oh, there's so. Do we need a coffee break? To this? <laughs> All right, Kat. But good response time, but not everyone playing along. All right, much better. Thank you. Oh, he's going to marry me. <laughs> When, when I selected these images, um, do you remember the, the um, you know, the, the flying nun? Yeah. Doesn't it kind of look like her? <laughs> Please remember. Huh? What do you see there? Yeah. How about this one? If you have nightmares tonight, don't blame me, please. All right. Uh, raise your hand if you see the, the black dots. Raise your hand. Keep your hands up. There'll be a urine test later because there's no black dots. <laughs> All right. Who can get this one? I'm counting. You can only use your brain. No, no devices. You only get uh, seven more seconds. Okay, 408. All right, now, um, almost on time for that one. Uh, someone have a device? Uh, we, we need to do a, a quality control check. Type it in and, and reconcile the response of 408. Who had 408? Who said it first? You got it first? Four, oh, let's we'll give her a hand. That's great. So uh, we'd like to get a, a blood test later from it, as you're clearly special, so we understand. Is there something like special with you? It usually takes, when I do this, uh, an audience of at least 50 to get one person to get it with under about 20 second time frame. So that's, that's actually quite exceptional. Um, had to change the formula when I started doing this in China, because they, they learned this like super math, this activist math. So I actually get with a bunch of our, our scientists to figure out a combination that couldn't crack in their 20 seconds. But this one, this one was used by Dr. Kahneman in his experiments. Essentially, when we went through those exercises, the images, uh, the dots, the formula were in inputs. And you processed it from the prison of your mind, and there was an output to it. Now, some of those had quicker response times uh, than others, and some were more challenging uh, than the earlier ones to do. But essentially, Kahneman was brilliant when he received the Nobel Prize, and, and he's a psychologist. You got the Nobel Prize in economics. They don't typically give that award to other people other than economics backgrounds. But from this 40 years of research, he was able to um, demonstrate through repeated tests that essentially there's two you know, concepts in making decisions. And the different parts of the brain play into it. So you get people really um, you know, um, confused when you talk about the limbic system, the neocortex, the hippocampus, and so on and so forth. So he was really brilliant. He was like, I'm going to explain in, in very in layman's terms. Yeah, basically fast thinking and, and the parts of the brain, you know, reptilian brain, where, you know, it's how you can feed, you can flight or fight and, you know, or, you know, or, you know replicate yourself. And, and those things run in very fast cycles, right? And that's system one, thinking fast. And those have kept us alive, making really quick decisions. And as a manager, you become a good manager because you get these neural mappings where when I walked in, worked in a hotel after 10, you know, 10 years, I could walk at the Port of Cachere and I could just sense if things were going right or wrong. And I'm sure you can with your operations too. You can just feel it. You look at a few data points and you can draw a really quick conclusion and, and don't stop that. Please continue to do that. But if you want to break through in levels of innovation, you have to think slow to get to those new levels. And, and that's something that we're really not designed to do incredibly well. Only, only a few of us, and we've got a lot of, so we study thinking slow, you've, you've got to create the right environment, conditions, and there's a lot to be able to do that. So we, we see system one in friend or foe, and this was system two. Now, 
how does this relate to kind of uh, creating a cultural change? Well, in, in two dimensions. One, if, if you subscribe to the theory that system one has dominance over system two, limbic part of the brain or the neocortex, uh, and that if you subscribe to what the scientists say, that it, it's six times faster than your other cognitive you know, reasoning skills, so it's going to outgun you know, all the time. And we took actual people that were going to make a decision. We partnered with um, the University of Tokyo. And this is an, we did this a while ago, so these are older MRIs. There's bigger, better, more expensive ones today. But we put them under MRIs, and not hypothetical, they were actually going to make a decision. And we looked at the part of the brain that lit up the most. And the uh, R factor, so it's 0.789, not squared, but I could give you a square if anybody wants that later. Um, it was pretty high for the amygdala in influencing those decisions, which relates back and validates Kahneman and now other people's science. Another one of our people, Deaton, just got the Nobel Prize on all the data that says, hey, people on average, we think, make about 10,000 decisions. I mean, do I put the pointer down again? Do I pick it up again? Uh, do I get tea? Do I get coffee? Uh, do I get married? Do I not get married? And what we find is as the decisions become more complex, uh, the less likelihood you're going to have system two. You're going to have more system one, which is kind of counterintuitive, right? You would think you put more system two into this. Um, how many of you are married? All right. Happily married? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, so that should be a system two decision, you would think. So how many of you created a spreadsheet with criteria, weighting factor for the criteria, and evaluated simultaneously multiple candidates for that position. Anyone do that? Anyone do that? Why did you do it? This is how you felt, right? It was, you know, so there was data. I'm, I'm sure you pre-qualified people, so it was not completely system one. So, so we know that's going on. But that's, that's an expensive decision. That's not like returning a pack of gum. That costs you some money. That thing doesn't work out for you. So there's a lot of things. There's your biases, cognitive ease that all inhibit our ability to make these system two decisions. Coherence. Um, I, you know, I'm not speaking for Gal, but this is my own crazy theory. My crazy theory is if there were aliens, if they actually existed, I don't know if there are, I don't have any data, I work off data, but if there were, the reason why we wouldn't know about them is because it would just break our coherence, right? It would just, it, our, our reality of the world would start to fracture. So you look for things that are gonna be reaffirming um, your, your thought processes, your system one. And what we find is that on average, about 70% of decisions are made based upon system one, non-rational criteria. And but what's, what's ironic is you're trying to convince people, you know, providers, ecosystems, patients, payers to make decisions based upon what? Data. So you're, you're swimming upstream all the time. On, on this. And from the qualitative interviews I've done, I've shadowed salespeople that sell medical devices. I'll give you one example of this. Um, we like to do something that Gallup call, it's called a compare and contrast. It's very simple, yet very powerful. We get your top people based upon uh, outcomes. So we like to look at somebody that's been in a role for several years. Uh, we've got outcomes for sub several years. So we can somewhat draw a conclusion between the behavior and the outcomes. They've been in that role successful in multiple locations, so it's not location specific or the team that they were with. And so once we kind of pull away all that for the sample to, to make sure that we've got a good comparative study, I'll give you an example of a, a day in the life of one um, medical device sales representative. The individual bottom performing group gets into the hospital. I, I follow them. They go right to procurement and they ask about, you know, uh, orders. I got the order statuses for this, and we got this for you. And they're talking about new products and that. And then we're out and we're off to the next hospital. The, the very best group, an example of one uh, that I studied, gets into the hospital, doesn't go to procurement at all, goes right up on the nursing floors. I saw this person fix a competitor's bed, literally fix a competitor's bed. and and. So it wasn't about the sales process, it was about how that person infused themselves in the patient pathway, right? So I'm not saying that's gonna be key to, that's the only key to success, but that's the non-rational type of behavior. No one in that company told them to go up and fix the competitor's beds. I'm sure of that. But that's what, that's what was the difference.
between those behavioral traits. Perceptions, here's the problem about the amygdala, it exaggerates things, it's, it's based upon emotion. And the other thing, it's, it, it controls short and long-term memory. So you got two things working. You got one, it's, it's overpowering your neocortex. Two, it's also influencing memories. And I'll, I'll give you an example of this. So this was part of Kahneman's research. I'll close up here uh, so I stay on time. Maybe ask me back or maybe not. So we have two patients, and this is a colonoscopy, patient group A and patient group B. On the vertical axis, the, the y-axis, you have pain levels from zero to 10, and none of them gets a 10. They, both of them gets about eight, so that's similar. On the horizontal axis, you have time, the number of minutes for the colonoscopy. And we see in patient A group, it was under 10 minutes, and there was uh, about 25 minutes for patient B group. Now, when those two groups were studied, and when they were asked certain questions like likeliness to go through this procedure, right? So readiness for this procedure again, which one do you think was more resistant to going through the procedure again, A or B? It's actually counterintuitive. I would have said A scientifically. It's shorter, same pain level, sign me up for that, right? It's significantly more, it's on patient group B. Why? It wasn't the experience, it was the last memory encoded on that experience had a lower pain level. Now this raises ethical issues, I mean, do you, do you, do you elongate the procedure for the, I mean, there's just like, you know, there's a can of worms on that one right there to kind of to talk around. But so when you want to change employees and customers, you have to look at not the experiences. And brand leaders and sales and marketing people are horrible at this. And I'm, I'm part of that group in my past life of trying to do all these little things for the experience. No, let's figure out the memory that we're going to imprint, either on that first encounter, the initial lens that you have with the, with the employee or the customer, and that initial lens is pretty powerful. Um, a lot of companies work on their most valuable customers by average or volume of sales. The most important customer from our data you can focus on is your first one. Because they're, they're putting their behavioral economic lens on you. And it's going to be a lens that they look at you throughout their lifetime. And it's a hard lens to really change. So potential. Uh, I'll close up with this. This goes to strengths. Um, one of the most powerful things you can do to change an individual or a culture based upon our data is to help them understand and leverage their strengths, both as an individual or as a collective team. And, and cultures are just a function of the aggregate of all the teams in your organization. So if you've got a great culture, you just got lower variation in a certain direction on your teams and how they function. So when we look at um, how people form, go back to nature and nurture, 42 days after conception, you got one neuron. Then when we're up to uh, age three, you got 100 billion neuron. And these are proxy. No, no one can actually measure this. So now they think that there could be 80 to 100 billion neurons. So the number kind of changes with each study that comes up. But general direction, it's a lot. But by age 16, half of those synapses are formed. Most of who you are has been formed by the age of 16. Neuroplasticity can continue for all of us who have gray hair, getting gray hair but it becomes much more difficult. So we want to take a look at natural strength. So here's, here's the final exercise we're going to go together. I'll read your question. Stand up if you always push an elevator button to remind the elevator there. Stand up if, if that's you. How many of you do that? Yeah, right, that's not bad, that's good. That's activator. I gotta go, I gotta go, I gotta go, I gotta go. I got a salesperson that I work with, I shouldn't use the word sales, business development, it's sales, let's call it what it is. And, and uh, literally, we've got all 34 themes sorted out, but I, I made a shirt for him yesterday at the conference. It, it was activator, 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 right? <laughs> um, I used to call them premature activation sometimes. But <laughs> Stand up if you need to pick someone to race with. Stand up. Embrace who you are. Yeah, competition. That's a competition thing. Not bad. It's good. Why do we make these things? You know, we put a stigma on it. Oh, competitions. But, oh, it's good. It's who you are. How about this one? Stand up if you always talk to people in elevators, airplane stores, or wherever you go. You just like talking to people. Oh, my goodness. There you go. Yeah. Get some, get some, get some woo and some relator. Maybe you like winning people over. That's, that's a good thing. 
I will do just a few more of these. Stand up if you seek a familiar face at a party. You, you just you look for somebody you know. Wow. Wow. You should work in business development. That's usually a good theme for that, right? Building, building a, a network of very intimate relationships. And I think this last one, stand up if you tend to be skeptical until given some proof. Wow, so that's the analytics there. That's probably good for a group like this. <laughs> and I think it's the last one. Stand up if you trust your intuition. Yeah. Uh, okay, good. So these, these are just all natural. Oh, here's the last one. Figure out the plot of the movie before it ends. Yeah, thanks. I... I, I I say thanks because my wife has this international talent themes. The problem is she likes to share it, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, please, we'd like to. I paid sixty bucks for the family. Let's not go there. So these are just these are just like natural recurring. So what, what we've done at Gallup, this is not a sales pitch for Gallup, but what we've done is we, we've developed an assessment to identify from thirty-four themes uh, where the sorted order, who you are and who you're not, and how this plays out when I come to work every day. Uh, my coach gets the best out of me by putting me on positions that help me thrive. So a practical example of that, just to close this up, when I, when I took this to um, so like, you know, my team, my global team at Marriott, I had a director, his name was Chad, and we had him go through strengths assessment development. He had, at the very top, all influencing themes. You know, I've never seen it loaded that heavy on influencing themes. But 30 years old, four levels below me in the food chain, and I go to Chad, I say, hey, Chad, uh, we did skip level meetings, you know, levels below. I go, Chad, um, I, I'd really like to partner with you on, on leveraging your talents. You just get this great influencing themes. Uh, would you be up to and want to maybe uh, do some international travel? And, you know, maybe if something comes up with these international markets, be part of that. You gotta, just because you've got a talent doesn't mean you can plug some money. You can understand, do they want to do it? Intention. And he said, oh, yeah, I'm excited to do that. So I said, okay, uh, next opportunity comes up, um, we're going to partner together on this. So, uh, you know, Corporate thinks everyone else, you know, doesn't understand the market and it's not executing right in the market. In my field operations, we always think that corporate's smoking dope and that's the reality of the dynamic, right? So you just kind of work through those things. So, but Frankfurt office um, hated a design that we just created, which we, they would have to pay for. So I go to Chad, I go, Chad, instead of me going on the, on the uh, plane business class to Frankfurt from DC, I want you to go and see if you can deal with this. I gave him no other instruction other than figure out what the problem is and I trust you to deal with it. But if you get caught in a corner, reach out to me. All right? Don't feel like I'm abandoning you, saying I trust you and then I'm not going to help you. So I would go there on those plane flights and I'd use my command and strong arm them. You will do it my way, right? <laughs> like the force. Um, literally, I woke up that morning. I was getting selfies with Chad and the Frankfurt team out in the bar, arms around each other. It's okay, corporate. We love you. It's great, right? That wasn't Chad's job description. That wasn't the job description of some people working in the hotels. We did a session with housekeepers, and I really got emotional on this one. We, we took housekeepers and showed them their strengths, and they, tears were coming down their eyes. They'd say, you told me I could clean a good room, but you never really told me what was special about me as a person until you talked about my, my strengths and how I fit in beyond just cleaning a great room. And so that can be taken all over the world. I'm going to get roped out of here. So um, if you want to learn more about strengths, you can go online. You don't need to talk to me or anyone else. Here's the conclusions. You have to have an integrated framework for changing culture. It's, it's not a campaign. It, there is a level of complication in that you have to have multiple reinforcing mechanisms. There has to be an affinity in the organization to reinforce the brand promise of value system. And that's in how you hire, how you communicate, how you reward, how you recognize, how you train, how you develop special ambassador groups. I mean, there's a lot of, there's about 15 key touch points you have to hit to really transform. That's why most organizations don't get it done because they, they take just a generic training approach. The second one is people are not rational, especially employees. So you, you can't, you know, the worst thing I coach executives is don't get in front of employees and talk about the shares and the revenue. I mean, you're just going to totally turn them off. You got to touch them at their heart. So you do a lot of work with senior leaders on emotional messaging. And some are, are you know, natural at it. Other ones, there's a degree of coaching that you have to do with them. And that's fine. It can be done. 
And the other thing is if you look at this last data point, and this is why both as a, a customer practitioner, I've always used strengths to change organizations, as wise I, I am a proponent to you. It's a one best thing you can have to change people in a positive direction, positive psychology. If you look here, uh, I got some charts. If you ignore employees, they're you active, you know, actively disengaged, it's 40%. So four out of 10, if you ignore them, they kind of hate the organization where they work and the team and all that. If I create a conversation with them as a supervisor, manager, boss, and I focus on their weaknesses, that goes down to 22%. I cut it in half. Just having a dialogue around things that you're never going to get good at as an individual. <laughs> but when I talk about your strengths and how you apply your strengths to the job, this is not like finger painting and weird things. Applying your strengths to your job and your role, active disengagement goes down to less than 1%. About 1% is like 0.9 something, right? But the, they make me round stuff up to show it, right? That's one of the most powerful things you can do to change a culture. So I know I went over a little bit. I, I apologize for that, um, and I'll, I'll turn it back to you. We can take time for maybe one or two questions. John, thank you for coming in today. I know how crazy busy your travel schedule has been the last few years. Really appreciate it. This was great. I've seen you do this a few times now, and I always take a ton of value out of it. Lots of great stories. The question I have for you, you have a lot of senior leaders in the room within the medical device space, very conservative industry, um, right, compliance-driven. Risk-averse, I would call it. Very risk-averse. So my question is, is around organizational structure, right? And you work with lots of different clients across many different industries. What are some of the more progressive uh, or best practices you've seen around structuring such that that internal customer experience drives that external customer experience and really maximizes performance? Yeah, um, to, so to create the right structure, it's a, it's a brilliant question. Um, you you have, to have to have the right data to guide you first. And so um, the opportunity is, um, on, on, on B2C, it's actually quite good out there. Because if you, if you buy a car, you're gonna get like nine surveys and you know, they'll probably try to prime you and tell you they'll lose their job or can't send their kids to school if they don't get a nine out of nine or whatever, right? So there's gaming, but there's a lot of data out there. Uh, some of it's, you know, biased to some degree, but for the most part, you know, there's a lot of companies, uh, you know, aside from Galt, they're doing a good job of collecting that. The biggest opportunity is on the B2B. This is what I've seen on B2B is when you um, lose an account or volumes or some key indicator, um, I, I tend to hear it was price right, it is the common factor that I hear. But when we've done our investigations, that's one of many factors, right, but it's so much easier to kind of cloak the situation on that. So getting the right metrics on the business relationship we have with your client first, and then drive that at the right level of accountability in the organization. Um, and that's something that we're not gonna like uh, be able to uh, totally unpack in the amount of time that we have. But for those who have been successful, understanding the, the voice and depth of their B2B customer is the first key step that they take. Because usually they're just working on volume transactional type data, and they don't really understand what's driving that behavior. And you gotta have that to drive changes in the overall structure of the organization, decision processes. For me, when you say structure, it's how decisions are made in alignment with strategy of the organization essentially we're trying to get at. So hi, Dr. I, I, I've got one hopefully quick question. Um, so a lot of what we heard really centered around, you know, the cultural shift within an organization, but uh, we're trying to do this across an industry, the whole ecosystem. Some of the things seem like they've got direct parallels, right? We're trying to really leverage, um, you know, a maturity appraisal to get in at what is a company doing well, right? When we talk about what are, what's it really good at? What are Appreciative inquiry, right? yeah. Um, so, I mean, first of all, just a lot of this stuff could probably be taken away from our internal use at FDA, but the idea of these principles applying on that broader scale, how easy is that to kind of, to translate across um, the ecosystem or within, or is it only really uh, achievable within that contained structure and organization? Yeah, our, our, it's so if, if you look at it that way, it's like boiling the ocean. It's like, oh my God, all the complexity and the relationships, and I'm not, I'm not, 
you know, those people, they, they don't report to me, and yet I got to drive this over. So I know all that complexity that I've seen breathing. Um, and my response is going to be very simple, but it's, it, I think it's fairly accurate. Um, the changes happen within the working groups or teams, whether they're matrix teams or they're departmental teams. And so anytime we have impact, we're looking at how we can change the dynamic of that team and make sure we can remove any inhibitors, barriers, whatever label you want to give them uh, that are holding those teams back for their progress. Um, our point of view is that teams tend not to be fully equipped uh, to be able to carry it out on their, on their selves. Um, so you get those, those uh, you know, unicorns that do it here and over there, but you really want to be able to platform and replicate that. So it's, 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 it's really the approach at that working functional research team, uh, you know, provider, uh, customer, or, you know, deliverer type, whatever it is. Um, but it's all going to come down to the, the, the inner mechanics of those relationships and, and how they're managed within the, that group. I know it's not a great answer, but that's, that's how the impact actually starts. All right. Well, thank you. Yep. Yeah.